Welcome to Pete That Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Today, we'll be talking about humanism and atheism in Nigeria and why it can be so dangerous. Our guest will be Leo Igwe, a Nigerian humanist and human rights activist. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Joining us from Nigeria to talk about how atheism and humanism is often persecuted in parts of Africa is Leo Igwe. He's a Nigerian humanist activist and a longtime friend of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Leo Igwe has multiple degrees in philosophy, and he has a doctorate in religious studies from the University of Beirut in Germany. He founded the Humanist Association of Nigeria. Leo Igwe's research focuses on witchcraft, religion, and atheism in Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, and Zambia. He was arrested and jailed himself for complaining about witchcraft. At the moment, he's campaigning for the release of Mubarak Bala, a Nigerian freethinker who is in prison for alleged blasphemy. Leo is working for the eradication of witch persecution and to foster cr critical thinking in schools. Thank you so much, Leo, for joining us today all the way from Nigeria. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Dan, for having me. Nice to see you again. I remember we had a fun time with the humanists in Cameroon a few years ago, and you're keeping busy in a country where being non-religious is pretty dangerous. Um, were you always a non-believer, or were you raised religious? I was raised religious in, uh, in southeastern Nigeria, and it was in the course of my upbringing that I began to question religion and the teachings of religious uh, establishment. And it was in the course of that questioning that I eventually uh, discovered humanism, and I, dis I eventually became a non-believer, uh, a humanist, and an atheist. Were you raised in a Christian family or a Muslim family? I was raised in a Christian family. Um, but actually, my grandparents were traditional religionists. Uh, my parents, you know, got converted to Christianity, because when they were born and growing up, that was when the missionaries, Christian missionaries came. And um, so my parents, you know, they're Catholics, and um, I was brought up in a Catholic Christian environment. So eventually you started, uh, you became a non-believer, and you started the Humanist Association of Nigeria. And now there's a serious problem with the current president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria, as we speak, I understand Mubarak Bala is his name. He's an atheist, the president of the humanists, and he's in prison right now, uh, allegedly arrested for blasphemy. Can you tell us more about Mubarak Bala's case? Mubarak Bala is um, the president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria, and uh, he was arrested in two, 2000. And 20, that was in April, um, for allegedly making blasphemous posts on Facebook. Hmm. And the police disappeared him for over six months. And uh, it was only this month that they were able to arrange him. And that's after a long campaign to get him 
uh, release or put him on trial. So, uh, and what was was the case? Because he he came out as a, an ex-Muslim, he came out as an unbeliever, and um, he was making posts uh, posts that were consistent with his non-belief, and which did not go down well with the Islamic authorities in northern Nigeria. So they decided to arrest arrest him, and they are currently prosecuting him. Is there anything that the international community should be doing to help Mubarak Bala? There's a lot the international community, you know, uh, can do, and, and, and they should be doing. First of all, this is not about Mubarak Bala. It's about religious freedom. It's about uh, um, atheism and humanism as, um, as an outlook or a life stance that people can always espouse. Because Mubarak Bala is just a test case, and it illustrates the dangers and risks that are associated with non-belief, and also with criticism of religion, especially Islam. So it is important that the international community and, uh, and the people in other countries understand that this is not specifically about Mubarak. It's all about what kind of world do we want? Will we want a world where people can be thrown into jail because they said something critical of Islam or, or the prophet of Islam? Or do we want a world where people can freely express their minds? You know, or, uh, you know, people, people can freely embrace religion or leave religion. So there's a lot that the international community could do, you know, to not just only support Mubarak, but also help in creating a free society where people can believe freely, people can express their minds freely, whether it's critical of religion or not. So, yes, it is bigger than just one person. But Mubarak is the person who's sitting in jail right now. Yeah. He's the one who's suffering. Yeah. Does Nigeria have a, a blasphemy law? And are, are there sentencings? Uh, are there, you know, penalties for blasphemy in Nigeria? Yes. N Nigeria has uh, provisions in its constitution that criminalizes what they call blasphemy. But, of course, the, the issue is that what is blasphemy? You know, nobody, you know, nobody actually, you know, has an idea what actually constitutes blasphemy. They said insulting religion. The question is that what is insulting religion? Again, so we have such in our constitution, and, um, but it, it has not actually been enforced. Where we have many cases of blasphemy uh, is usually in the Muslim-dominated areas where Sharia law is being enforced. So, Apparently, what is going on is that Mubarak is being tried, you know, for blasphemy in an area where Sharia law is being enforced. Indirectly, he's being tried under Sharia law. But uh, the Nigerian law is being used as a front, you know, just to punish him. And, and what would, what's the possible sentence if he's found guilty? Well, I think that they are trying to make sure that he's given maximum sentence. Yeah. Ordinarily, in a, under the Nigerian law, um, the punishment is about two years. And he has actually spent about that, you know, the sentence already. By April, it will be two years since he was arrested. Um, but um, um, for us, we think that the Islamic establishment, they are not, um, they're not satisfied because they think that the sentence under the Nigerian law is very light. So they are trying to make sure that he is punished, you know, he receives, you know, a maximum sentence. He is punished as much as they will want. So nobody actually knows exactly what is going to be the outcome of the case and what the sentence will be like. But one of the outcomes might be that other humanists, maybe like you or others, maybe they have to keep their mouth shut. Maybe they're causing fear among the non-believers. Is that true? Yes. There is a lot of fear and panic within the humanist community in Nigeria. And a lot of um, Muslim extremists have been threatening to attack uh, non-believers, humanists, or atheists. And I have actually received a lot of threats from Muslim fanatics. Some of them, you know, sent me a message and said, we have gotten Mubarak, you are next. Wow. So there's a lot of panic within the Muslim community because the purpose of the arrest is actually to clamp down on the non-believe, uh, non-believing community, to clamp down on humanists, and um, 
And uh, it is important that uh, we also understand that um, this is an opportunity to begin to uh, campaign against, you know, intimidation, denial, subjugation, oppression and persecution, you know, not just only of uh, ex-Muslims uh, or people like Mubarak, but also humanists and atheists, so that people can freely embrace or renounce religion, or renounce Islam, criticize Islam, because that's exactly what the kind of society we want to create. So is persecution for blasphemy um, rare or common in Nigeria? And are we also seeing apostasy, this idea that um, uh, Mubarak Bala was born a Muslim and now he's leaving it, and that's apostasy? Before now, before the case of Mubarak, we used to hear about allegations of blasphemy. But they all, they usually end up on the streets. Islamic mob, either they, they kill, behead, they attack such persons. Now, but recently that we are having more cases because it's not only Mubarak. We have a, the case of a, a Muslim musician, you know, um, he sang a song, you know, that says that uh, maybe a holy man from Senegal was greater than the prof prophet Muhammad. And they charged him for blasphemy and uh, sentenced him to death under Sharia law. So uh, it's not only Mubarak that, you know, is having this kind of, going through this kind of process. They are Muslims. So that is why when we are campaigning against blasphemy laws, it's not only that, uh, uh, that humanists are targeted, atheists are targeted, but even Muslims are targeted, you know, because some of them belong to different sects or some of them belong to different um, uh, uh, traditions. And uh, sometimes they are targeted, you know, are using blasphemy laws. So um, we are having those cases recently. Uh, in the north of Ni Nigeria. And like I said, it's not really Nigerian law that is being enforced. It is Nigerian law is being fronted by jihadists who are actually, you know, trying to enforce their Sharia law. So the people prosecuting uh, Mubarak are jihadists, you know, who think that what Mubarak is doing is against Islam not necessarily against the Nigerian law. And I think we should just say briefly that in Nigeria, you technically have a separation of church and state, but um, in some of the states, nevertheless, they are enforcing Sharia laws, and that's very confusing to me. When we come back, Leo Igwe, a religious scholar, um, founder of Humanists of Nigeria, we want to ask you a couple of things about the demographics of religion in Nigeria and Africa in general, and also, the witchcraft persecution of people for witchcraft and how you ended up getting arrested and jailed for trying to help them. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan. Lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no religious body seeks to impose its will, directly or indirectly, upon the general populace. Let's restore respect for America's secular roots. Help the Freedom From Religion Foundation defend the wall of separation between state and church. Join us at FFRF.org. Freedom depends on freethinkers. My name is Jarvis, and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. There are many reasons why I'm an atheist, but I'll start with the crudest explanation. I'm sure many of you have seen Clash of the Titans or The Immortals or 300, these blockbuster films about ancient Greek or Roman religion, which we now call mythology. But back then it wasn't mythology. It was very real for them. They genuinely believed that you had to put a coin in a person's mouth 
before they were buried so that they could pay for the literal ferry to the afterlife. Just as many people today believe that they should eat crackers and wine on a Sunday or that God wants women to hide their bodies under black burqas. Every religion that has ever existed, and there are many, have all believed that they were right, that their rituals and rules and beliefs were 100% correct, and they all thought they nailed it. But where are they today? Uh, if they're not completely forgotten, they're on the silver screen, amusing us with their sword fights, animal sacrifices, and oracles. The religions of today are the entertainment of tomorrow. Everyone, I hope, is an atheist about Zeus and Apollo, Juno and Poseidon. I just added Jesus and Muhammad to that list. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with Leo Igwe. He's in Nigeria, I think, uh, Ibadan, Nigeria. And uh, he is the founder of the Nigerian Humanists. We were talking about uh, the current president being arrested for blasphemy. So welcome back, Leo. Thank you so much, Dan. So we've been talking a lot about the persecution in Nigeria, but we haven't talked about what the demographic breakdown is by religion in Nigeria or Africa in general. So um, is, is the country evenly divided between Christians and Muslims? You see, this is what they tell the world. That's the, what you read. If you go to Google, that's what you read. But we know that in reality, that is not the case. But ask yourself, when, when was the last time we, we carried out, you know, credible census without religious, co uh, religious coercion and all that? I mean, we, we, we can't recall. I can't, we can't recall when we did that. So, but what they try to tell the world is that, oh, we have about 50%, sorry, 40% Christian, 40% Muslim, maybe about 5% uh, there about, maybe about 2% who are non-religious and all that. This is religious demographics at the back of the persecution of people who, who would like to, you know, leave religion. For instance, the likes of Mubarak Bala. In, in northern Nigeria, you know, leaving religion is like, you know, it's like a death sentence. So how can one actually rely on such demographics? Yes, the statistics puts non-believers in the, in, the, in, the, in the minority, but they are questionable statistics. They are statistics based on religious coercion, religious intimidation. So for me, they are not reliable. So maybe there's a lot more non-believers than we think in Nigeria. Yes, there is. I'm not saying this because I'm involved. I'm not saying this because, but I'm saying this because of my experience not only being, being born in a religious family and living in such a religiously charged country, but also be leading you know, uh, the, the, the humanist movement and non-religious and non-believer movement in, in the country. The fact there is that many non-believers cannot come out to us. For instance, looking at what is, Mubarak is going through, many non-believers do not want to come out. And I know a lot of them who are on the closet, and the question is that they can't come out because they could lose their job, they could lose their lives, they could lose their family, they could lose their partners, or even they could take their wives from them. People could go to that extent. Or they could get their, either their family members to poison them or to kill them just because they come out. Not only coming out, but going public. So a lot of people are, you know, are non-believers, but officially on records. They will tell you they are believers just because they want to remain alive. I mean, what kind of society is that? Yeah. Yeah. So in these northern states where there's basically Sharia, even though there's supposed to be a separation of religion and government, um, is it, uh, what's it like to be a woman or an LGBTQ individual? Uh, are they safe? Are they better off in the areas dominated by Christians? Well, what happens is that in, in, in places, for instance, where, where Islam is uh, dominated, Everybody is socialized to understand where you belong. If you happen to be a non-believer, you know that you're a third-class citizen. You should not be seen. You should not be heard. If you're a woman, you know you're a second-class citizen because the, 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 the Sharia law is what actually, you know, you know the do facto law. That's the actual law that and uh, what people are, are, what is being used. If you're an LGBTQI person, you know, you, you are a criminal. You're a criminal, officially and socially. You know, uh, it is either you, you are in prison or, of course, you're as good as dead. Because um, a, an Islamic scholar said at a public gathering I attended some years ago that um, there is no provision for homosexuality under Sharia law. 
And actually, he suggested that a few homosexuals who were within the community should be rounded up and killed. Mm. He said this publicly. He said oh. this publicly. So that would tell you, you know, the status of LGBTI people. But the fact remains that the, the Islamic scholars or Sharia uh, enthusiasts cannot determine the social space for everybody. Yes. And we cannot allow them to do that. So it is important that we begin to check them in terms of and not allow them to determine the, the fate of non-believers, the fate of women, and the fate of LGBT. Yes, the situation is very bad, but the fact remains that we cannot allow them to decide and determine the fate of these people. Yes, it's so important that you're there fighting this. I mean, we are facing many of the same problems here in this country with, for example, the Christian nationalists and trying to ban abortion. So um, more power to you, Leo. But now, um, in the time we have left, can you explain the situation with witchcraft and how you ended up being jailed for trying to do something about it? Witchcraft accusation is a big issue in Nigeria because the Christian establishment, Christian churches, many of them thrive on it. Hmm. In the absence of providing any real help to people who are in need, to people who are poor, to people who are experiencing all sorts of challenges, of course, due to absence of the government and state support. Uh, many pastors strive on imputing witchcraft or making witchcraft allegations. In their attempt to legitimize themselves, in their attempt to pretend to be offering help to families who are facing problems by making them understand that their problem has to do with either a child or an elderly woman, you know, in the family who is possessed by the de by demons and which, of course, they always try to, you know, give that name, we a witch, you know, in order to make people feel very strong about the possession and the problem in the families. Mm -hmm. so, so if you try to uh, challenge this, you are actually challenging what the church has used to establish its credibility amongst poor, gullible, desperate uh, members of the population. And of course, they will go after you. And when they go after you, the state that is weak already is unable to protect you. So that's exactly what we are, the, the kind of challenge we are facing here. So in this particular situation, we've been making this campaign and the state feels that, in my own case, we were giving them a bad name by highlighting these cases of accusations. The churches feel that you are really, you know, uh, uh, your campaign is denying them their power base, what they're using to legitimize themselves. So sometimes you see the state working with uh, Christian establishment, Christian churches against those who are, you know, campaigning uh, against witch hunting in the region. So that's what happened when I was uh, actually arrested and put in jail. Yeah. So, um, but... Uh, as we know, history is always there, and uh, there's always there are all, there are a lot of mechanisms out there to help us keep pressuring the states to fulfill their roles, and not allow the churches to continue their gospel of hatred, their gospel of intimidation and exploitation of vulnerable members of the population. So, Leo, what happens to those women and children? Well, what happens to them, you know, is for me is an open question because in the sense that. The state doesn't want to take responsibility, yes. And uh, when, when some of these children are accused, they are left to their fate. Nobody is there to assist them, unless there's a lot of pressure from NGOs, from the kind of campaigners like what I'm doing and what a few others are doing. So, so unless you put a lot of pressure, government might then reluctantly respond. So the, that's what we're saying. What happens to these women? You have to pressure their family members to protect them. But the problem we have is that the accusation originates from the family. So when these accusations are made by family members, it's always difficult to also mobilize family members to come and protect these people. But are the, they stayed there. Are the yeah. women, are they women persecuted? Are they kicked out? Are, are they denied food? What, yes, what? They, they suffer all sorts of, you know, abuses. Now, some are kidnapped and taken into the bush. Some are attacked and killed. Some are set ablaze. Recently, we have a case where a, a young man set ablaze about 
set people on fire, brought them in the night, brought them out to a public square and poured gasoline on them and set them on fire, including his own mother. Wow. Yes. He's as bad as that. And, and so, his children, too, correct? Yeah. Children, yes. Parents abandon their children, you know, and whenever they are, they are, they are alleged to be witches. They, sometimes they torture them, they, they starve them, they deny them food. So witchcraft, believe, is a, is a social poison. Yes, it contaminates, it pollutes the society. And because when you criticize it, you are, you are, you are, you are taken to be criticizing religion, and you are taken to be you are against God, you are critical of, you know, the God universe. So they, they tag you atheist to delegitimize you, because in Nigeria, immediately they said, oh, that man is an atheist. It means that you shouldn't listen to him. The person hasn't any moral argument, to, strong moral argument to make. So that is the challenge we are having. Children, elderly women especially, you know, uh, and elderly persons, they are targeted by this wave of violent campaign. And it's so much that the states get overwhelmed. And again, state actors, police officers, and uh, uh, people, you know, who work for the government are also religious people who have this belief. So they are reluctant. They are slow to intervene and, you know, come to the help and assistance of victims. So we know from history in, in the Western world how many, especially women, but some men, were put to death, persecuted, you know, tens and tens of thousands, if not millions, of women in the Western world put to death and hunted down as witches. And so it, it comes out of the Bible, from one mm. verse in the Bible, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So it's sort of horrifying to hear about the situation continuing in Nigeria and some other countries. but. Um, we're so glad you are there, Leo um, Igwe, um, to speak up for them, but we're out of time. So we want to thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, it's a pleasure. And we also want to thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because as you can see, Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.